questions. Um, so get us started this morning uh, is Lisa Gaddis, who will be uh, talking about rationale for landing sites at Lunar Pyroclastic Deposits. That's unfortunate. I can't see what I'm talking about. Um, so I may turn around a little bit. I'll try not to get too far away from the, how's that? Oh, thank you. Excuse me. All right, so yes, as Tim said, um, and I, I did want to point out that Sam Lawrence and Julie Stopar also contributed to this presentation, and they are busy with a new little one, so they're unable to make it to this meeting, although I notice someone else will be standing in for them um, during the meeting. So um, just a quick uh, overview of what I'll be talking about. It's only a few minute talk, so I don't probably need to go into too much detail in this, this part. Um, but so the lunar pyroclastic deposits are explosively emplaced, as you would know from the name. Um, with, they have diffuse boundaries, so they're often associated with vents, but not always. Um, the notion there is sometimes the Mare have covered the vents um, later on. The largest ones we believe are fairly ancient by association with um, adjacent Mare, but I will say that it's difficult to do crater counting on these, although um, Carolyn Vanderbogert and others are making progress on this because they are um, unconsolidated and friable and they don't retain craters in the same way many other units do. Um, they're globally distributed. I'll show you a map in, the, in a minute. Um, typically observed along the Maria, often associated with floor fractured craters and, and so on. They have a, a wide range of sizes and the largest are considered regional and the smaller are considered localized. Um, there are um, just under 90 of these, but I will say pretty much every year someone tells me they have one or two more and uh, I have a student who's in the process of, of collating that information and trying to add it to the database that we have. Um, <clears throat> so the largest deposits were thought to be formed by fire fountain eruptions. Um, they tended to have a relatively high volatile content with the emplacement of particles through ballistic trajectories. They tend to be widely distributed, fairly thin, a few meters, um, and they have abundant juvenile material with quenched glass, crystalline beads, um, and in the case of the black spot deposits, of which Rima Bode at the right there is one, um, they have high titanium. The type examples that we know from the landing sites are Apollo 17, Rima Bode, Sinus Astrium, Sulpicus Gallus, those kinds of deposits. And there's an image at the bottom showing how the eruption might have occurred. The smaller deposits um, were uh, explosive, but on a smaller scale, um, possibly intermittent violent explosion caused by degassing under a magma cap. Um, the volatile uh, for these thought to be uh, carbon monoxide rich gas. Um, these deposits have mixed juvenile and juvenile um, and non-juvenile materials, so glass, crystalline, uh, basaltic material tend to be uh, mafic, and uh, some amount of fragment and country rock, and we know from uh, looking at this with Moon Mineralogy Mapper data at Alphonsus that even within the floor of a single crater, the, the eruption style likely varied a little bit with different amounts of juvenile material around uh, the vents. Um, so the type example, as I mentioned, is Alphonsus. That's a vent on the right there with the yellow arrow, and Oppenheimer Crater on the far side also has similar kinds of vents. So here is the global distribution map. Again, about 90 of these are mapped here. Um, in yellow stars are the floor fractured craters from uh, Joswiak uh, and others, and then the, in blue are the faults and fractures from Wilhelms. I know there's a more current map of those that I'll I'll need to add to this. But you can see they're, they're distributed all across the moon, so they're relatively accessible in the sense that um, you should be able to find them in almost any region of the moon except some uh, vast regions of the highlands. And why would you go there anyway? <laughs> um, anyway, so they're comprised of these primitive glass and quenched spheres, and you can see the Apollo 17 view through a microscope on the right <clears throat> with the, the dark, uh, excuse me, crystalline beads and uh, the clear orange glasses. They're relatively unprocessed from deep within the, the lunar mantle, <coughs> and they have interior crystalline, uh, crystals of olivine and, and uh, ilmenite and so on. They have a relatively uniform grain size of about 40 microns, and they have surficial, the, the glasses themselves have surficial enrichments in a number of volatile elements, some of which are listed there. 
Um, so they're, they're mafic uh, with varying amounts of iron, and they have also uh, varying amounts of titanium, which is, tends to be related to the color of the glasses that were sampled. And, and so there, Delano um, uh, noted 25 varieties of these, and there are many more varieties that have since been discovered. <coughs> Excuse me. So although we understand that the moon is generally volatile depleted, um, recent sample analyses of the melt inclusions in some of these glasses from Apollo 15 and 17 found evidence of water inside them and uh, other magmatic, associated magmatic volatile species. So um, in, uh, among the first of these discoveries was Sol and others in 2008 where they found um, uh, up to 36 ppm of magmatic water in the Apollo 15 glass beads with correlations with other magmatic, <coughs> magmatic elements, excuse me. <coughs> and they, know that the, they noted that the concentrations decrease toward the edges, so it's not likely to be contaminated, contaminants from Earth. Um, and then in uh, Hori et al. in 2001, found much more water in olivine crystals from Apollo 17. And these are definitely from a primary lunar magma um, with source water abundances that are similar to, to those of Morbs. So quite a lot more water. Um, is present in these uh, with some of these more modern methods. So this uh, relationship was used by Lee and Milliken and Milliken and Lee in two, 2017. These were published um, to and Moon Mineralogy Mapper data, which is hyperspectral multi uh, remote sensing data to map uh, uh, to perform a quantitative analysis of the the band at 2.85 microns, roughly just under three microns. Um, where they mapped OH and uh, water in the um, surface mineralogy. And so this is their uh, resulting map. Um, this maps the SPAT parameter, effective single particle absorption thickness, um, which they also, I understand, used for Mars analyses and so on for, for many years before applying it to the moon. And so they found water abundances up to 150 ppm um, with uh, increases in that amount nearest the vents. So it's actually possibly um, the, the data from M3 vary in spatial resolution depending on optical period, but you might be able to use these data, for example, to point toward a vent if the vent itself is not, not visible. <clears throat> I did want to say, um, whoa, okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> There's a bit of lag there. So this is a huge deposit at um, Sinus Aestrum, which is not really visible in this map, so that's kind of a notable thing. Um, but here is Rima Bode. Whoa. Whoa. Sorry, I, I think I won't do that. Um, <clears throat> so um, there are also exogenous waters or solar wind implanted volatiles associated with uh, basically mafic materials in mature lunar soils and of course the pyroclastic deposits fall into that category and particularly those that are high titanium. Um, and these materials are thought to be relatively evenly distributed within the upper few meters of the surface. They require heating to release them. Um, I should point out there is, a, on the left there, table one is a, um, from uh, Crawford at, uh, in 2015 where he, he lists from Fegley and Swindle the list of solar wind implanted volatiles and then from Carrier et al. the amount, uh, the mass per cubic meter on the right in the table. I'm sorry, you may or may not be able to read that. Um, and then here is just a map of um, helium-3 in the lunar regolith from Fa and Jin um, in 2007 showing one um, some of these uh, volatiles mapped uh, and correlated with uh, the Mare deposits. <clears throat> so because of these um, mafic materials and high titanium materials, um, the uh, pyroclastic deposits have been the subject of ISRU types of uh, research for many years now. Um, the, the water uh, um, is available for oxygen, drinking water, the hydrogen for rocket fuel and as a reducing agent in the in the equation on the right for production of lunar oxygen uh, by reduction of ilmenite. Um, and I said from Larry Taylor here because the, I found so many different versions of this and I know you've all seen them many times and so um, Larry was a, a prolific um, proponent of this kind of research. Um, so the deposits, as I noted, are rich in iron and titanium, and so the, ax the extraction of oxygen from these deposits has been discussed. Um, so Carrier and um, 
Taylor and Carrier in 1992 mentioned on, only 20 of these methods, and so there are a lot more methods available now. But they require high, both hydrogen and energy to, to achieve. Um, so if you were going to study on the surface these kinds of deposits, um, then I, I believe you would need mobility. Um, the, the deposits themselves, as I showed, are mapped, uh, are located all across the moon, and so they're relatively accessible in many ways. The surfaces are traversable in the sense that the materials are, are felt relatively smooth surfaced, tend to not be associated with steep slopes, although of course there are craters and boulders. Um, and so a survey mode on any given deposit would support horizontal assessment of the feedstock for iron or for oxygen, um, estimates of thickness and vertical distribution from, from event outward, and determination of consistency of materials um, at any given site. Um, but <clears throat> sample return at these would provide a more precise determination of the composition and, and also support calibration um, from re remote sensing analyses. For, for example, for ilmenite content, the presence of olivine, which helps you understand um, the composition of the source materials, and also these are where uh, many of the um, inclusions have been found with water. Um, the amount of indigenous water and also su the surface correlated and solar wind implanted volatiles. Um, so here is just a, a, a list of the SKGs that would be addressed at these kinds of deposits, um, understanding the planetary volcanic processes, moon's resource potential, and the nature and distribution of these, these kinds of volatiles. Here are just some examples of the science questions you might ask. Um, one of the obvious questions is how old are these? We're, we're believing that um, we see fairly young um, volcanic deposits on the moon. Um, it's possible there are also young pyroclastic deposits, and there's possibly quite a large age variation in these, but we haven't um, determined those ages very thoroughly yet. Um, are some eruption styles more likely to be associated with deposits that have indigenous water? We don't, we don't know the answer to this yet. Uh, which deposits contain olivine? Olivine is difficult to distinguish in some cases from glass in uh, remote spectra, and so we don't have a definitive answer for that question either. Um, and then how thick and uniform are the deposits? Does thickness vary? We know it does away from the vent, but how much? Um, and then just fundamentally how much material is present in any given deposit? And the, the, the spots that I would recommend are the black spot locations. These are higher in both iron and titanium, um, and they include Taurus Litro. They're illustrated in, in many instances in, in this image here, which is a 3D view of Sinus Aestium with Rima Bode up in the distance. Um, also Humorum, uh, which is not a black spot deposit, but is high in iron. Um, and then Aristarchus, um, which Erica Jawin will talk about shortly. So. Tim, you're allowing questions now and then maybe again later, or? Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes for questions now. Anybody has a question? Do all pyroclastic deposits have titanium? No, they don't seem to. We do, we do find what we think are high titanium deposits in Oppenheimer, for example. So we, we have found them on the far side as well as on the near side. So they're not just around, for example, um, Tranquilitatis or Serenitatis. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks, Tim. All right, um, up next is Erica Jowan. Um, she's talking about Aristarchus, the, most, the moon's most explosive eruption. Aristarchus Plateau is a future exploration destination. Thank you. So now that you're all convinced that we need to go to a pyroclastic deposit, I'm going to tell you which one we should go to. Um, specifically, it is the Aristarchus pyroclastic deposit, and more generally, the Aristarchus Plateau. Uh, so to get everyone calibrated, the Aristarchus Plateau is here in this boxed region present on the lunar near side in Oceanus Procolarum. It is one of the three lunar volcanic complexes on the moon between Rumker Hills to the north and the Marius Hills to the south. And Aristarchus Plateau um, is the largest of the three volcanic complexes and is generally believed to be one of the most diverse volcanic 
um, locations on the moon. And uh, a volcanic complex just specifically uh, refers to a region of a high concentration of volcanic uh, features. So the Aris Aristarchus Plateau itself uh, is formed of an uplifted highlands block. The plateau contains uh, several sinuous rills, the largest of which is Vallis Schroederi, which you can see cuts through the center of the plateau and is sourced at Cobra Head, that circular depression. Um, there are several other sinuous rills on the plateau extending off to the distal edges. And the entire surface of the pyroclast of the plateau has been mantled by the pyroclastic deposit. So when we talk about Aristarchus, we're really talking about end member volcanism. And that's because Vallis Schroederi, the sinuous rill that I just mentioned, is both the widest and the deepest sinuous rill on the moon, not the longest, but that's all right. Um, and so this is a scale of volcanism not seen elsewhere on the moon. And in addition, uh, as Lisa mentioned in her previous talk, um, the pyroclastic deposit here is the largest pyroclastic deposit on the moon, around 50,000 square kilometers. Um, and so the explosive eruptions that form this deposit were, in all reality, um, the most explosive vol uh, volcanic eruptions seen on the moon. Um, and so I believe that warrants some further analysis. Uh, this image on the right here um, is an M-cube spectral parameter map showing three different um, spectral parameters that really highlight the difference between the Mare basalts and the pyroclastic deposits. Um, and you can see that the entire surface of the plateau has been mantled by these pyroclastic materials that show up as more yellow-green in this map. And this distinction is caused by the presence of volcanic glass that was just mentioned in the previous talk. Um, Aristarchus is believed to be the most glass-rich pyroclastic deposit on the moon, uh, greater than 90% iron-bearing glass, and this is quenched volcanic glass rather than um, impact melt, for example. The deposit is quite thick, believed to be around 10 to 20 meters thick with um, some variations depending on where you are on the plateau. Um, and as was mentioned in the previous talk, there is evidence for trapped volatiles in the volcanic glasses, both from pyroclastic glasses that were returned to Earth, as well as um, endogenous uh, volatiles potentially trapped in the pyroclastic deposit here as mapped by Millikan and Lee. And as you can see on the image on the left, the Aristarchus pyroclastic deposit is one of the most uh, hydrated regions on the entire lunar near side. And you can see in this uh, close-up image of Aristarchus the locations of those more hydrated regions. So Aristarchus, uh, as we've discussed, contains a very uh, interesting volcanic history. It also contains important links to the lunar impact chronology. The plateau itself is believed to have been uplifted during the formation of the Imbrium Basin. So investigating the plateau itself would really help us to calibrate the um, exact date of the Imbrium Basin, as well as other features that were formed as a result of the basin formation. Aristarchus crater itself, which you can see in this Apollo 15 image here, uh, is a well-preserved Copernican age crater that has excavated a diverse suite of different minerals as mapped by, by Mustard et al. 2011, including plagioclase rich upper crust, olivine, pyroclastic glass, and impact glass. And this image to the left um, is an image from Mustard et al. 2011 showing, uh, again, three different M cubed parameter maps showing the diversity of the spectral features in Aristarchus crater. So some scientific questions that can be addressed by visiting Aristarchus are listed here. These are a combination of questions from the Decadal Survey, the SCHEM report, as well as in italics a couple of my own additions. These can be broken down into three different categories. Um, referring to volatiles, we can ask, what is the volatile budget of the moon? Do volatiles on the moon constrain ancient atmospheric origins, sources, and loss processes? How are volatile elements and compounds transported and sequestered in the near surface? Um, volcanism, you can ask a diversity of questions here, including the distribution and time scale of volcanism on the moon. And then more specifically, what is the relationship between explosive and diffusive volcanism on the moon? And with respect to impact cratering, you can ask questions such as, what were the sources and timing of the early and recent impact flux of the inner solar system? As well as more specifically, the source of diverse units excavated by Aristarchus crater. Turning to engineering questions, um, these are some SKGs that were listed in the SKG SAT review. Um, all of these strategic knowledge gaps could be addressed by visiting various parts of the Aristarchus Plateau, including lunar resource potential, such as investigating the composition, volume, distribution, form of pyroclastic deposits, quantity, quality, distribution, form of hydrogen species, preservation of volatile components during sampling, 
uh, the lunar environment and effects on human life, for example, radiation, uh, effect, radiation environments, radiation shielding, specifically in the pyroclastic deposit itself, as well as questions about how to work and live on the lunar surface, um, such as excavation and transportation of lunar materials. And the physical properties of the Aristarchus Plateau itself do provide several good places and safe places to land and then explore. Uh, slopes in the region generated from the Kaguya Lola DEM show that the entire plateau, with the exception of crater interiors and the sinuous rill, have very low slopes between zero and four degrees. So it provides you ample locations to land and then rove around. Um, uh, Earth-based radar data from Arecibo show that the circular polarization ratio, or CPR, of the pyroclastic deposit is very low, suggesting that the deposit is fine-grained and thick, as we discussed early, earlier, but also it's block-free. So if you're concerned about landing in a safe, block-free location, there are ample opportunities on the surface of the plateau. And in addition, from spectral data from m -cube that we saw earlier, the pyroclastic deposit appears to be spectral hom spectrally homogeneous. And this means that you're not restricted to a certain location on the plateau if you want to go and sample pyroclastic materials. There's really a range of locations you can visit depending on your capabilities and requirements, and you still will be able to sample the pyroclastic deposit. So what I've done is outline two potential exploration zones here. One is located on the central plateau in the pyroclastic deposit, and one is located near Aristarchus Crater. Uh, incidentally, these are also quite close to where the constellation landing sites were. That was unintentional, but it shows that these are good landing sites, potentially. Um, and so we'll just quickly discuss each of those. The first one, EZ1, in the pyroclastic deposit, as I just mentioned, is near the central part of the plateau, um, far away from the uh, modifying effects of the Aristarchus crater impact. Um, this location uh, is within the pyroclastic deposit in a thick location, and so you can address a variety of scientific questions in this area. Um, for volatiles, this is one of the most hydrated regions on the plateau, so you can answer a lot of questions about um, volatile budgets and, uh, um, and capabilities in the pyroclastic deposit. From a volcanism perspective, this is an area, a thick area of the pyroclastic deposit, so you can have plenty of material to sample and analyze. You're also close to a sinuous rill in EZ1, just to the north, and also uh, Val Schroederi is fairly close to the south, and so you, if you have mobility, you can assess one or potentially more than one sinuous rills in this area. From an impact perspective, local kapukas um, can expose plateau material without the requirement to drill. Um, <coughs> distal Aristarchus ejecta will probably be mixed into your uh, pyroclastic deposit in this area, so you can get a more diverse sample suite that way. And small impacts near the landing site, wherever it is, um, would be able to expose the local stratigraphy in the area. So you would not necessarily need to rove or drill to be able to see some diverse samples in the area. With respect to uh, engineering questions and strategic knowledge gaps, going to this area would really address all of those questions that we uh, discussed previously, from questions such as the volatile budget of the pyroclastic deposits, uh, radiation shielding, uh, and in addition, uh, sampling and traversing on the lunar surface. Turning to our second exploration zone, EZ2, which is near the Aristarchus crater. Um, this region is in a portion of the plateau that has a thinner pyroclastic deposit because it, because it has been mantled by stratigraphically younger Aristarchus crater ejecta. And so unfortunately, this region has a much lower um, hydration characteristics mapped by Millikan and Lee. So the scientific questions and the engineering questions regarding volatiles are not as valid in this region. But what you do have in this region is many more applications with respect to impacts, which I think are scientifically very compelling. So in this region, you can see a small deposit of impact melt on the Aristarchus crater rim that you could land at or rove to. Um, we discussed yesterday the importance of analyzing uh, crater impact melt, so that would be very interesting. The crater ejecta itself includes uh, units such as the pyroclastic deposit and the plateau, but also includes units that originated from next to the um, plateau in the surrounding region, including mare basalts and lunar crust. So you'd be able to assess all of these different units just by landing and exploring near the crater. In addition, um, crater exposures such as olivine that were uh, brought up from depth within the Aristarchus crater is mapped by Mustard et al. in 2011 could be sourced from depth, and so analyzing these units could help us to constrain the lunar interior structure. 
from a volcanism perspective, um, again, the pyroclastic deposit is not as thick in this region, but you do still have pyroclastic materials in the region, so you could address a lot of the questions there. You would be able to access the sinuous rill, Valis Schroederi, via Cobra Head, which is just to the west of the landing zone. Um, and you also would be able to uh, um, access interesting silicic volcanic units, which I'm not going to talk too much about because Tim's going to talk about that in his talk a little bit later today. With respect to exploration applications, as I mentioned, the questions regarding volatiles would not be as useful in this area, but you would be able to still address questions regarding the lunar environment and effects on human life, as well as how to live and work on the lunar surface. With regard to mission requirements for mobility and sample return, what I've outlined previously does not require a mobility and sample return to answer fundamental scientific and exploration questions. Uh, the pyroclastic deposit is homogeneous, so you can really go anywhere on the plateau to sample that material. Uh, the crater ejecta from Aristarchus is widely dispersed, and plateau kapukas are present on the entire surface of the plateau, so you still can address several impact questions. And as we discussed, small impacts provide local stratigraphy without the need to traverse or drill. However, as everyone here knows, mobility and sample return would really enable insights that were not possible using stationary in situ analyses alone. And the classic example of this is what we discussed in the previous talk, the solid all 2008 discovery of water in the quenched lunar glasses uh, in quantities that would not be detectable with in situ capabilities. So we really do need sample return to do these really rigorous in-depth analyses. So in conclusion, uh, fundamental questions about lunar volcanism, impacts, and volatiles can be answered by exploring the Aristarchus Plateau. The pyroclastic deposit on Aristarchus provides a rich testing ground for engineering capabilities and for closing SKGs. And several mission designs are feasible in the region, not requiring mobility or sample return. But these capabilities would greatly enhance scientific and engineering discoveries. And finally, the location, safety, and the scientific and exploration opportunities present on the Aristarchus Plateau really do make it a critical make it critical for future landed exploration. Multiple missions deployed to various locations on the Aristarchus Plateau would provide insights into fundamental lunar questions. So I'm not saying we need one mission to Aristarchus. I'm saying we need several missions to Aristarchus. Thank you. Any questions? I uh, have been uh, for a long time very curious about the, the ultimate source of the volatiles. Do you have any thoughts on that? The, the source of the volatiles in the pyroclastic deposit? Yes, yes. Um, I think that the work by Milliken and Lee really showed that they probably are endogenous to the lunar interior, and so there is something about the mantle source that, that sourced the pyroclastic eruption was more volatile rich than other more effusive eruptions that we saw in the basin filling Mare, for example. So you would not expect them to have uh, originated from the magma, o the residual magma ocean, right? Ooh, you know, I think we need some sample return to answer that question. <laughs> 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 All right, thanks very much. Right, uh, up next, uh, Paul Spudis is going to talk about mission to the Rima Bode Regional Pyroclastic Deposit. First two speakers have done an excellent job staying on time. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I've discussed a little bit about this at the league meeting, so uh, uh, you've probably heard some of this before, but if you'll bear with me, what I'd like to describe today is the first Moon Express uh, lander mission. And with any luck, that will go sometime this year. Uh, effectively, the launch vehicle has been launched once. It was going to launch again the second time in December. They had to abort it a couple of times. It should launch sometime this month. It's the Electron, which is a very minimal payload to TLI capability. However, we are able to put a payload on the Moon Express lander of about 10 to 15 kilograms. So uh, what we want to do, the early landing missions are going to emphasize the, what I call the four S's, safety, simplicity, shortness, and significance. What we want to do is to land in a safe place. We want to keep the mission ops concept simple. We want to have a very short mission duration so that whatever we're trying to achieve, we achieve within one lunar day. And it's got to be a, some kind of significance. And so what, I, what I've been trying to do for the last couple of years is develop a mission profile 
that provides both scientific and uh, exploration value. The exploration value is in the form of, of a resource characterization. So you've heard already this morning about pyroclastics. I don't have to go on this uh, uh, very much. But lunar pyroclastics have both scientific and exploration significance. From a scientific point of view, they're primitive, unmodified samples of the very deep lunar interior. They were erupted uh, and ascended through the mantle very rapidly, so they're not fractionated. The source regions are clearly volatile rich because they uh, formed in explosive eruptions. And the eruption mechanisms are really quite interesting. And I think one of the things that uh, I'm interested in, in terms of pyroclastic vents, is searching for xenoliths, chunks of the mantle rock that have been included in the ascending magma as it rises up through the surface. By the way, the picture here is of, uh, on the top left is Io. It's not the moon, but it has this magnificent volcanic plume visible on the limb. And this is something, probably what some of the uh, pyroclastic eruptions on the moon might have looked like. From a resource point of view, pyroclastics have a lot of value because they're uniform, small grain size, and that's very useful for handling large quantities of material, both for excavation, transport, and processing. So it's an easy feedstock for resource processing. But more importantly, they have apparently, they, they at least the potential to have a lot of uh, adsorbed solar wind hydrogen. And that's what I want to really talk about in this talk. The premise we want to test is this alleged correlation between very fine grain, high titanium materi lunar materials and high solar wind content. We have reason to believe that on the moon, high, high concentrations of implanted solar wind correlate with smaller grain size, high ilmenite content and mature soils. If you have those three characteristics, you might have a lot of solar wind gas sticking to the lunar materials. It's not that they get any more flux, it's just that they retain more of it. Now these properties suggest that mature high TI pyroclastics are a good candidate to look for high amounts of solar wind uh, uh, implantation. The pyroclastics at Apollo samples don't meet these criteria for two reasons. The Apollo 15 green glass is very low in titanium, so it doesn't have that part of the, of the equation. And the Apollo 17 orange and black glass was buried, and in fact it was excavated by Shorty Crater, so it's a very immature surface. So what we want to do is to find a site that has very mature, high titanium uh, regional pyroclastics that would meet all of these criteria. So here's a map of some of the major regional pyroclastic deposits on the front side of the moon. Uh, the one I, uh, that's always drawn my attention is one of my favorites, and that's Rima Bode, which is, uh, as Lisa mentioned earlier, it's, it's adjacent to uh, Cenus Istum. It's, it's, in fact, truncated by the lavas of that particular crater. If you look right there, you can see that the lavas of Istum embay the pyroclastics, and those lavas are dated at about 3.5 billion years old. So the pyroclastics here are at least that old, if not older. And it's, it's very quite apparent in a lot of different data sets. So Rima Bode is quite extensive. It's over 7,000 square kilometers of manling material. It has a very low albedo. It's one of the lowest albedos on the near side of the moon. It's between 7.5 and 8.9%. It's probably black glass. It's probably the black equivalent of the orange glass that was sampled at Shorty Crater. Uh, I mentioned it was embayed by Maria that's been dated uh, with crater counts. It has a very complex vent and eruption system. You see, it's got a linear fracture. If I can, uh, whoops. This is Rima Bode, and the actual source vent is right here. It has a very complex shape. If you look at high resolution, and there's a lot of really good high resolution coverage here, because not only do we have uh, NAC stereo for a lot of this, we also have a set of spectacular Lunar Orbiter 5 high resolution images, which have very high resolution. And the highest resolution images you see are completely block free. It's astonishingly smooth. And if you look carefully, you see that this dark deposit, in fact, uh, covers the back slope of the Apennines, ejected from the Imbrian Basin. Now, the inner montane areas there have relief of between, uh, from a few tens of meters to hundreds of meters. That, and since the surf top surface of the pyroclastics are nearly flat, it suggests that the thicknesses of these things may approach several tens of meters. The other thing that's interesting about these pyroclastics, because they come from deep in the moon, I think this might be an excellent place to actually look for xenoliths from the mantle around this uh, source vent. So looking at some different properties, just to kind of give you an idea of what, what the properties of Rima abode pyroclastics are, the true color image is from the WAC color data on uh, the, the LROC website. And you see that it's very 
black and very blue. It has a bluish tint and it's extremely dark. When you look at Arecibo circular polarization ratio, this is S-band CPR. It has some of the lowest, return, lowest CPR on the moon. It's actually much lower than about 0 0.2, which suggests, as was mentioned before, a very block-free surface. The two, the two compositional maps, titanium is from the WAC uh, titanium map that's on the quick map uh, tool, and you see it as the highest, oops, sorry, let me go back. The highest concentration of uh, titanium exceeds 12 weight percent near the center of the, of, the, uh, of the deposits. Iron exceeds the ability of the Clementine data to actually map iron. It's greater than 20 percent weight percent. So these, are, these meet all the criteria. It's a mature deposit. It's smooth and block free. It has very high titanium and very high iron. So let's, close, let's look at a candidate landing site. This is the one I picked that looks most promising to me. Here is the, uh, the deposit. This crater here in the middle, this is Bode E. It's about six and a half kilometers in diameter. And the area that's just to the northeast of Bode E is extremely smooth. Now in this image, this is a half meter per pixel image. I have not been able to identify a single block in this area. And the same is true for the few NAC images we have that are a quarter meter per pixel. So it is extremely smooth, it's extremely flat, and it's very uncratered. So it's a good place to send a lander if you're not certain how much precision you have in your landing algorithm and you want to make sure that you have a nice safe landing site, this is a great place to go. So the MX-1 lander is a very simple lander. It basically can carry, it can be outfitted with a wide variety of payloads. For this mission, I've only picked two, and we want some kind of instrument to measure the chemical composition of the soil, and we want some instrument to measure the hydrogen content. And the best way to do that is a simple alpha particle backscatter experiment, nearly identical to the one used on Surveyor, back in the 1960s. It's perfectly adequate. It'll show the degree of the titanium content of this deposit. It's very simple to operate and doesn't take very long to uh, accumulate the data. Also, a simple neutron spectrometer will measure the bulk hydrogen in the upper meter of the regolith at this site. These two experiments together will immediately give you an answer to test the premise of the question. Do high titanium mature deposits have excess solar one hydrogen? Typically, what we'd expect for a deposit like this is for, for a lunar Mari deposit is something between 50 and 100 parts per million. I suspect here that we have uh, uh, hydrogen concentrations well in excess of several hundred parts per million. The question is how much in excess of that? And this can be measured very simply by simple instruments. It's a very light payload, so it doesn't take up much spacecraft resources. Uh, the measurements are complete within the first couple of hours of landing. And one of the planned activities of the MX-1 lander is to, is, to, is to make a hop. That's how we're going to answer the mobility requirement of the Google Lunar X Prize, is to hop from one place to another. So we'll be able to take these measurements in more than one place because they're simple to accomplish and you can do them in two different locales. So effectively, this mission, as simple as it is, actually, actually gives us some fairly high-level answers to scientific questions. I included a list of other possible instruments. These are other things we've been looking at, not only for this mission, but also for future uh, Moon Express lander missions. And all of these are low mass, low power, low data rate instruments. They can all assess different aspects of uh, the lunar surface. And by the way, I'd like to invite any member who happens to have small breadboard versions of working instruments that they'd like for cons to, to be uh, considered for inclusion on a payload to contact us, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you and, and talk about that. So to summarize, the first Moon Express landed mission is likely, go, likely to go to a safe site, one that's in the center of the lunar near side for ease of operations, one that basically lands early in the lunar morning, so its mission can be completed fairly quickly, but at the same time provides some kind of significant scientific and exploration result. The significant science here is understanding the properties of, and the interaction of solar wind content with composition and maturity and the resource aspect. Basically, if we, have, if we determine that these are high hydrogen containing deposits, potentially it's a great place to do resource processing because you can actually excavate the pyroclastics, you can extract the solar wind hydrogen, and you can reduce the iron oxides in the glass to make oxygen. Mission operations are simple and short. You get the results a couple of hours after landing. And lunar pyroclastics are a significant nonpolar resource that's present on the moon in many locales. Thank you very much. You did even better than the first two speakers on the I time. So. <laughs> um, any questions from Paul? 
Uh, yeah, Dean. Do you, do you have any issue with contamination of the general area of your lander from exhaust gas on the landing that would screw up your measurement of the... Uh, no, not, not, with these, not with the instruments we're sending because they're fairly low precision. So we're, we're answering this to sort of the order of magnitude level. We're not making precision analysis. Um, one thing I'll, I'll point out, actually, um, a really neat paper just came out in GCA by Kate Burgess and Rhonda Stroud doing TEM uh, analyses of um, pyroclastic beads, chromite, um, ilmenite. They found that the titanium bearing um, uh, phases actually trapped not just hydrogen, but helium, solar wind helium as well, uh, which could potentially be, be a resource too. Yeah. Um, Really neat discussion, uh, Paul, and I love uh, Rima Boat as well. Um, but you didn't mention much discussion of the pyroclastic deposit immediately to the south, Sinus Aestium, which has spinel. Uh, yes. Yeah. You got it. And if you want, <laughs> if you want mantle xenoliths, you know that's the pyroclastic area to try to go to. One, one, one of the reasons I focused on Rima Bode was that had much larger contiguous areas of smooth terrain than the, the Aestum deposits. So I, just just for the first landing, we want to relieve any great precision constraints from the landing ellipse. I suggest a simple experiment that you could do possibly with the instrument that's already on board is if you have a camera and you know the orientation the spacecraft is going to sit down, if you could point it at a single spot and the angles are correct, you could uh, characterize the phase response as you go through, I know I assume you're going to land at Donish. Right. So you might be able to get a whole zero to 110 or 120 degree phase angle. Yes. And especially as you go through that 90 to 105 degree, it might be really interesting. And it would help us to calibrate how to actually compute titanium from pyroclastic glasses, which we don't know how to do. And so I, I think that you're claiming that's 12 percent is 12 percent plus or minus eight. Or right. Something, right. Right. But you know, this would be a great experiment. So you, yeah, but no, you'd I have to have the camera oriented and you know, correctly, like at 45 degrees pointing down, um, not in the shadow of the spacecraft. Right. Yeah. No, I, I agree. This, this, the, the lander will have an imager. I don't know if it will have an imager of the photometric precision and pointing ability that you would need to do that experiment, but that's certainly something we, could incl we can include without a lot of, uh, we could accommodate that. Good morning. Just a quick question. When is this first mission scheduled? That is a very good question. I wish I knew. It, it's not scheduled yet, all right? The, 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 the Moon Express plan is to launch two spacecraft this year. The first one will be an orbiter to kind of make sure that the bus works and all the systems work. The second one will be the, le the attempt at, at the landing. And we hope to have it done this, by this calendar year, so we may well be at Rima Abode before by this time next year. That is my hope. Um. We're actually running a few minutes ahead of schedule. Maybe it makes sense to bring Lisa and Erica back up here as well. Seems like people have started Can waking up and asking questions. Why don't you stay too, just in case? <laughs> so um, I think now would be a, a good time to have an open discussion about, um, about pyroclastics and where we go. Um, I'll just, as, as you will see from my talk a little bit later this morning, I, I've a, particular fondness for Aristarchus <laughs> as well. Um, but it seems like there's a, there's, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of neat things to see. Um, Jack, you want to start us off? Well, I, I'm, I presume, uh, I'll address this first to Paul, but everybody can answer. Uh, I presume that you're expecting the particle size of the Park Classics to be on the order of what we saw with uh, the Shorty Crater. Yes. 40 micron average. Size. Uh, do you see any difficulty in terms of landing visibility? Do you need that? Because that's going to be, it's going to be quite a cloud uh, moving away, not a cloud, but material moving away from your landing point. And it's certainly, do you need an imager to actually land, or are you in good shape? No, I think we're in good shape on that, and, and you're right. We don't actually know, we've never been to a mature pyroclastic, so we don't actually know how that's going to behave physically. But my guess is that, uh, it will be a it'll be a fairly safe and simple landing. Yeah, it, but you and but you don't think there's any issue. You're going to be moving a lot, I think, of that very fine pyroclastic away from your landing point. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. that visibility is not going to be an issue. Right? I, I, I don't think we rely on, on visual imaging to land. I think we use a radar altimeter. Okay, and it also means that you're going to, your analysis at any given landing point is going to be a material that's deeper than the surface. Obviously. Sure, but I mean, you get ordinary, that's, you get ordinary gardening. We suspect that there's no, diff, there's no stratification of the deposit. It's largely homogeneous. It appears laterally homogeneous. Well, we certainly have stratification at Shorty Crater, so. Uh, well, you ha that's where you had the orange and black glass interlayered. This, all, this stuff all looks black, it looks jet black. Well, but still, it, it may have uh, multiple eruptions are likely, it, it and so be. you probably have layering. That's it could true. be. Yeah. Jack, are you referring to descent imaging in particular, something like that? Yeah, if you need it uh, to, if you need to be able to see the surface in any way. Yeah, I, it's I, going to, material is going to be moving away from the... Uh, I think descent imaging is really good for, for sort of local con context, um, nest, a, a series of nested images as, as you're descending, but uh, it's not part well, of... Well, that probably, I don't think that, it you wouldn't be start to see the uh, effluent start to move the uh, pyroclastics until you got fairly close. I right. Think. If I could just make a comment about that, I think what you're talking about is also a reason why you should go to the thicker regional deposits as opposed to the smaller localized deposits. If you're going to be disrupting a lot of the continuous paraclastic material, you don't want to blow all of it away and leave you nothing to actually sample. So if you go to these thick deposits that are tens of meters thick, even if you disrupt the upper meter, you know, the upper surface, you still have plenty of material to sample and analyze. Uh, John? Uh, hi, John Stock, USGS. Uh, it seems like it would be very useful to have a well-constrained terrestrial equivalent to the lunar pyroclastic deposits because you could test a lot of industrial processes on it. So my question to the panel and to others in the audience is, what are our knowledge gaps to identify that terrestrial equivalent, both for composition as well as geotechnical? Well, part of the problem, if, if, you're, if you're thinking resource processing on the moon, uh, what I'm specifically interested in is, is adsorb solar wind hydrogen and, and other volatiles. And that is not something you can easily simulate with a simulant. So there, there's a lot of glassy pyroclastic deposits associated with terrestrial volcanoes, but they're not good analogs to mature lunar pyroclastics because they haven't been exposed to, uh, on, to the surface of the moon for three billion years. But certainly things like, like oxide reduction can and has been tested at the lab scale, and, and it all seems to work and hold together. And speaking from a, more of a geotechnical side of things, the lunar pyroclastic deposits are quite different from terrestrial pyroclastic deposits because we do have these quenched glass spherules. Mm -hmm. And on Earth, you have weathering, so you can break up these grains, but on the moon, they are quite circular and spherical. Um, so if you're looking to create a lunar simulant, we can create quenched glass quite easily. So if we create a very fine-grained spherical glass, regolith type material, that, that could potentially be useful for uh, engineering testing. I think I heard you guys identify a, you know, hydrogen, no, and quench spirals, but it seems like there's a broad spectrum of properties there that there are knowledge gaps for. I, I think in the sense that we don't have, we, there are a lot of people who've synthesized the glass and, and crystallized spheres in small quantities, but we don't have anything large enough, I think, um, that you could use for, you know, a, a lab um, uh, geotechnical properties kind of analysis for them. And they are, as Erica says, they're very different on Earth uh, where, where they tend to be more fizzy, basically, more gaseous. So there are potentially gaps there in, in uh, extrapolating from one to the other. Okay. Thank you. Shui? Yeah. Uh, question to Paul. Uh, you mentioned in your talk you're going to assess those hydrogen. So do you have any equipment to assess whether it's a hydrogen, hydroxyl, or molecular water? Or do you have equipment to you know, demonstrate you can extract those volatiles from the gas beads? No, this, this is, we're keeping this very simple. So we're only measuring the bulk hydrogen. And, and a neutron measurement will not tell you what form the hydrogen is in. So it could be present as, as, as solar wind protons, it could be hydroxyl, it could be water molecules, it could be bound in, in mineral structures. Shuai, before you go, do I recall in your image that sinus astium is not water rich? Yeah, exactly. So they are very interesting because they are so close to each other. I did a 
detailed geology map, I feel like Cineas Estrom and the Rima Boulder, they're connected. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any like clear boundary between them. But right. one shows very enhanced water, the other one doesn't. So that's very interesting. That's why Carly mentioned, like, why not go to Cineas Estrom? Actually, <laughs> I want to go to Cineas Estrom. Yes. <laughs> To very quick, we got to move on. Move on uh, yeah, just a party pooper point about the resources for Lisa, I guess. Uh, 300 and 400 parts per million of water is one cup per ton. Right. And so that's not going to be very useful for life support. It might be useful for processing, but uh, right. it's a lot of work to yes. get a reasonable amount of water out. Yeah, I didn't go into any detail except to say that it requires energy, um, but it requires a lot of energy. That's true. Okay. Carly, last question or point? I can't respond to that one. Well, okay. Um, uh, this, is, this is stimulated by what Paul's been talking about. Uh, namely, he's looking for, for surficial solar wind materials, but the very landing of the spacecraft is going to disrupt that. Uh, this is a more general question that probably can't be asked, answered in a few minutes by the panel or other people in the room, but we need to know how much of that upper surface is disturbed uh, be, because the kind of issues that you're trying to address when you land depends on what you actually land on, and that's going to be disrupted by the process itself. And it may, in fact, remove the very things you're trying to look for, Paul, because you're, you're blowing away the things that have been exposed the most. Well, you but know, I don't know the answer. You know, this, the, first of all, it's, it's a very small engine plume, all right, because it's a small engine. It's a small spacecraft. And, and yes, it'll, it'll blow away the uppermost layer, as the lunar modules did, <laughs> But I, I don't think that implanted solar wind gas is going to restrict it to the upper few centimeters. I mean, it's, it's in the entire column. Now, you can't, you're right, you can't understand how that varies with depth with a simple mission like this. Yeah. My, only, yeah. my only effort is to pick something where we can get a first-order answer to a significant question, and that's why we've designed it this way. All right, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Oh, sorry. I was just going to sorry. say this Go is ahead. an argument for mobility also. Sure thing, yeah. Right. Thanks, everybody. Let's uh, thank our uh, Pirate Classic speakers for their time. All right, uh, we're going to.